So, um, yeah, so uh, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, third lecture. And um, um, as I, I, the, I want to remind you, can you hear me? Can people at the back hear me? Okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned, that uh, I had this funny title, which was classicalization, scrambling, and thermalization. Um, and I, you know, uh, if you recall, just to remind you that in, in the first lecture, uh, I talked about how in the radial limit of QCD, you got this very high occupancy of gluons. And then that high occupancy of gluons meant that you could think of the physics as being classical. And it also happened that from the point of view of scattering, so if you thought of a quark-antiquark -quark pair in deep elastic scattering as being a probe, that quark-antiquark -quark pair would see this classical object as, as a black disk. So it would look, it would unitarize the cross-section also. So classicalization and unitarization were two sides of the same coin. Uh, and then I showed you in the second lecture explicitly how one could construct an effective field theory in QCD, which would capture this physics. And this gave you renormalization group equations, uh, so very powerful things. And so, um, and today I'm going to talk about um, how one goes to produce matter in, in high energy heavy ion collisions. Uh, and and uh, we'll see how far we get. And then in the last lecture, I will talk in more in detail about uh, thermalization. So again, to remind you, um, the uh, what I talked about was the Hadron wave function at very high energies. Uh, and the cartoon that you see here is the landscape of the strong interactions. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the rapidity, uh, which I, some, for some funny reason is called tau here. Uh, it's just log of x. And on the x-axis, you have q squared. Uh, and so what we found is that there's these new regimes that are uncovered. So previously, people just thought about hard physics and soft physics. And soft physics was physics at the scale lambda QCD. And hard physics was physics at the scale much larger than lambda QCD. And now we are arguing that this new structure which is hidden in the theory, which is represented in high energy hadrons, where you have a nonlinear regime of the theory that's manifest, that's represented by a color screening scale, the saturation scale of many body physics. Um, and that's the matter that is called the color glass condensate. I explained why it's, it's obviously, that's, that's obvious. It's a glass because remember I mentioned that the large x degrees of freedom uh, live on much longer time scales than the small x degrees of freedom. So there's a kind of separation of scales and that's why it's like a glass. And it's a condensate because the occupancy of gluons is the maximal possible in QCD. It's one over alpha s. So one, whenever you get an occupancy on the order of one over the coupling, that's a sign of the formation of a condensate. And then I argue to you somewhat briefly that actually this, this, in addition to this nonlinear regime, the, the range of the uh, nonlinear regime extends out to even larger values of momenta. And that's this extended scaling, which I talked about briefly. So it's a kind of shadowing of this nonlinear distribution, which extends out to higher PT than naively than you would get. Uh, I didn't talk about that at great length, but I'd be happy to discuss that with other people, uh, people later on. And then, you know, eventually at high enough PT, you get the usual PQCD parton gas. So this, this approach is very powerful because as I say here in the slide, it gives you a first principles description of saturation, geometrical scaling. It gives you smooth matching to perturbative QCD uh, and the appropriate limit. And this EFT provides powerful tools, not just to compute, say, parton distributions, but n-body correlators of the theory and the energy evolution. And that's represented by these acronyms, MV, BK, Jim Wolk. And so it's a tool then for precision computation. So in principle, one can use this framework and you can compute systematically order by order in weak coupling, um, many features of this 
non-trivial many-body theory. And there is a state of the art now for the number of processes, which is uh, at next to leading order and next to leading log x. So these, these, these are resummations to all orders in x uh, systematically in, in, in orders of the coupling. Um, and these also include all these power con corrections due to the nonlinearities of the theory. So in principle, this is a very powerful framework for systematic computations in QCD high energies. And what we want to move on to now is to understand what this means for high energy scattering, specifically that in heavy ion collisions. Now, I also want to remind you that there's a basic governing principle here, is that there's this saturation scale, like I mentioned, and the saturation scale grows with energy. So what is shown on this plot on the y-axis is the typical momentum of gluons in the hadron wave function as a function of kT. Uh, and what this plot shows is that what all these RG equations tell us is that the gluon momenta get harder and harder. This, this, this curve moves outwards as you go to higher energies or higher rapidities. And so it's telling you that the physics becomes systematically harder and harder. And therefore, the soft, the contribution of the soft sector to cross sections becomes smaller and smaller. And so we can compute systematically this physics in QCD. So that was kind of the basic idea in this, in this framework. So this is very helpful because the, it's a paradigm shift in our thinking about heavy ion collisions because um, when people were talking about heavy ion collisions at high energies in the in the in the 70s and 80s, uh, apparently you know people thought this was some horribly messy stuff from which you would never learn anything, uh, and this is kind of encapsulated by this cartoon here, uh, where you say you just you know you 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 sort of uh, smash two heavy things on each other and you get a lot of a lot of uh, un you know unmentionable words. And and uh, you're not going to really learn anything from from this. And and what I'm going to argue to you is that actually you learn a tremendous amount, um, both in theory and in experiment, um, because and and one of the governing principles for that is the fact that there's semi-hard scales which allow you to compute things um, rather than being truly non-perturbative. So. Um, as a result of a lot of work, uh, we now have uh, a kind of standard model, if you like, of heavy ion collisions. This is not a standard model in the sense of the standard model of particle physics, but it's more similar to the standard model of cosmology, where, where there are a set of conjectures and ideas which give you um, a, a sort of a, a simple principle which encapsulates all the phenomena that you see, but in which each of the individual elements have still open issues that one can try and question or understand better. Uh, so it's it's nowhere at the level of precision of the standard model of physics, uh, but it's really a governing principle to try and understand um, a, a range of complex phenomena in this particular field uh, and, and to try and put all the pieces together in some systematic way. Right? So, so as I mentioned that, you know, this space-time evolution, we can try and push from very first principles of the actual wave functions of the hadrons to see how eventually you form possibly thermalized matter. And um, you might have heard already in the lectures of Professor Florkowski about hydrodynamics and um, and that part of the evolution, so that's not going to be my focus in these lectures. My lecture is really focused on how one would achieve hydrodynamics or thermalization in the first place from first principles in QCD. So uh, in thinking about this, like I said, there's a standard model of cosmology. Uh, it's it's a, it's useful to ask whether this correspondence is just um, just a just a fanciful of there's something actually a little bit more to it uh, that's that's concrete. So on the left you see our standard picture of the Big Bang where we believe the universe started in some um, in terms of uh, this highly inflationary state created by the decay of a classical field, the inflaton field, which then 
through a non-trivial process somehow thermalized uh, and, and produced a lot of matter that happened around the gut scale, uh, we believe. Uh, and then this matter then evolved and cooled. And then about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, there was a decoupling of matter and radiation, which had been strongly coupled at that point. And then eventually, you know, we went through uh, a lot of uh, interesting physics uh, with the formation of stars and galaxies, and that's where we are now, 13.7 billion layers later. And now we can look back and look at the cosmic microwave background radiation and look for fluctuations in that background radiation, which then tells us about how matter went back in time from there on. And there's a similar thing in the in, in heavy ion collisions where you have this highly occupied field uh, that's created from these colored glass condensates. Um, I will call it the plasma. And then this matter evolves, this classical field evolves, decays and, and possibly forms thermalized matter, which we then observe much later in our detectors. And then we look for patterns in this distribution of particles to try and learn back about what happened at the earliest times. In the, in the heavy ion collision. And so uh, I'm going to focus now on how actually these colored glass condensates in some detail collide and they have an initial overlap and then they form this highly non-equilibrium matter. And rather than keep calling it non-equilibrium matter, I'm going to call it a glasma. It's a state intermediate between the colored glass condensate and quark gluon plasma. And um, for want of a better word, that's 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 a good way to summarize um, the regime of non-equilibrium physics uh, that we are interested in, and to understand whether this matter by itself has interesting universal properties that are similar to that in other fields. <clears throat> so, to further that connection between the Big Bang and the Little Bang, a little bit further. So, the Big Bang, what we have is a decaying inflaton classical field which has a very high occupation number, which goes as one over the coupling of that field, self-coupling of that field, so it goes as one over G squared. Uh, in, in, the, in, the, in QCD, uh, you have a decaying glasma, which also has a very high occupation number, it's one over G squared. So if G is small, the occupation number is big. Um, what we find in the Big Bang, and this is what I'm going to talk about in the QCD case, is that the classical field, the inflaton field, as it's evolving, um, interacts with small fluctuations. There are small quantum fluctuations around that classical field, which, which start out at small momentum, and then these small fluctuations grow explosively. Okay? So these can be due to uh, a phenomenon called parametric resonance, and then this, these small fluctuations become as large as the classical field, and this is a phenomenon called preheating and is, is thought to be an important component in understanding how the early universe thermalized. And similarly, in the glasma, there is an explosive amplification that I'm going to talk about of small momentum fluctuations, which grow exponentially. And these are in, in plasma physics known as Weibull instabilities, generically. So there are lots of instabilities in plasma physics, and this is one particular class of such instabilities. And it's the interactions of the fluctuations with the inflaton field in the Big Bang case and the interactions of the fluctuations with the glasma, the quantum fluctuations with the glasma, that lead to thermalization. And what we are now understanding also is that there are other common features between these, these two kinds of theories. There may be topological defects and turbulence, and the latter I'll talk about in this talk. And the former, I, if I get to it, I will talk about it in the next talk, in the final talk in the series. Okay, so how do you form a glasma in the little bang? So here you have these two nuclei um, coming together to collide. And so you have highly Lorentz contracted quarks, valence quarks, which are Lorentz contracted as the Lorentz factor, one over gamma. And then they have a fuzz of weak gluons surrounding them. Uh, which have some width on the order of 1 over QS. Okay, so that's the typical color screening scale. That's the only scale in the problem that we know of. So they collide, and then you produce a lot of stuff, right? So that's the, uh, that's the two cars hitting each other kind of analogy. 
But now what happens is that the, the balance quarks, which are carrying most of the momentum, they kind of go through each other in the collision. They are moving very fast, close to the speed of light, and they kind of go apart from each other. But then they have, they're connected to all these gluons, right? And that's what these lines, these diagrams suggest. And then it's these gluons, which are much slower, which actually produce a lot of the matter that we see uh, in our detectors sitting in the regime of central rapidities, which is low momenta compared to the balance quarks that are flying away. But these balance quarks are providing the seeds for these gluons. So they are sources for these, for these soft gluons that are being produced. And you can't just throw them away. They carry color charge, which couples to the color of the soft gluons. And so this is the matter that's produced. And then eventually this is the space-time diagram that evolves, that you see. So on the y-axis is time, on the x-axis is, is the longitudinal um, direction. And, and the balance quarks are flying along the light cone. So that's what I call spectator nucleons on this plot. And the matter is then produced in the middle here. So uh, on this space-time plot, the variables are the, the rapidity uh, where which goes from plus infinity on one light cone to minus infinity on the other light cone. Okay, so and so what we are looking at is is matter that's produced close to rapidity eta of zero. Okay, that's where most of the matter is sitting. While the matter at very high rapidities and heavy ion collisions, so at at least for example, um, the fastest particles go at nine units of rapidity on one light cone and close to one light cone and the, the other valence quarks go at minus nine units of rapidity. So, so and rapidity, uh, you know, as you go to higher rapidity, you get closer and closer to the light cone, while at low rapidities, you're really in the central region where you have most of the matter being produced. So the problem then that we want to solve from first principles in QCD is how do you compute multi-particle production in the central rapidity regime um, where in the presence of strong time-dependent sources. Okay. Uh, by the way, the other variable that's often used in, 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 uh, in, in these collisions is, is the proper time tau, uh, which, is a, a, which is a log of x plus t or x minus t. So the usual variables in these high-energy collisions are the two transverse coordinates, the rapidity, um, and and the uh, and the proper time. Okay, so you can understand this evolution in the forward light cone in terms of these hypersurfaces of constant proper time. So the hyperbolae are proper time surfaces, while the dashed lines that are going from left to right are the rapidity change in the rapidity variable. And the two transverse dimensions are out of the board that that, that you see. So again, to reiterate, the problem is computing particle production in the presence of strong time-dependent sources because these valence quarks now are no longer static. They've acquired some time dependence. They have color charge, so then they help generate particles in the forward light cone. So the problem of computing multi-particle production, so on the right you see the plot, the famous star uh, plot, from the star detector at, at, at Brookhaven uh, from relativistic heavy ion collisions of gold nuclei, and where you see that you produce thousands of particles in the heavy ion collision. So how do we study this, in principle, very messy problem? So, um, so first of all, one has to change one's thinking about this. It's not perturbative versus non-perturbative. Um, even when the coupling is weak, the physics is non-perturbative. Okay? Because like I mentioned, the coupling goes as 1 over g squared. I mean, the, the occupation number of gluons goes as 1 over g squared. You will never get a 1 over g squared in perturbation theory. Okay, So the physics is intrinsically non-perturbative. So the real question is whether the physics is strong coupling, where the coupling constant is large, or weak coupling, okay? But in both cases, the physics is non-perturbative in the sense that it can never, no observable in, of interest in heavy ion collisions in, 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 for the bulk matter can be understood as a simple expansion in the coupling constant unless you go to very, very high 
energies, like when you're looking at jets and so on, their actual perturbation theory may be valid. Now, this way of formulating the problem, by the way, is exactly analogous to how one produces... Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Is this fine? Okay. So, so the, the way I've formulated the problem is exactly similar to how one computes pair production in strong electromagnetic fields. So, for example, if you're using lasers to study uh, strong field QED, this is exactly the kind of formalism that would use. It's, it's the basis of the Schwinger mechanism in QED. And also, if you want to compute Hawking radiation in the vicinity of black hole, uh, what you're doing is you're computing pair production in, in the presence of a strong background field in which, in this case, is gravity, right? So, so this is exactly analogous to those problems. And in fact, we have found strong correspondences in both cases between how we formulate problems here and in those other two situations in nature. So, is there a question? Okay, okay, let me go on. So, um, yeah, please don't hesitate if you have a question at any point. So, uh, there are these two, there, so there are two approaches that we know of. There are two clean theoretical limits uh, in which one can study multiparticle production. So, one is so called, the so called ADS CFT conjecture, where you, it's, it's, and also sometimes called holographic thermalization. And that's based on a remarkable duality that one observes between very strongly coupled um, gauge theories. Uh, so this is this is Yang Mills theory, supersymmetric Yang Mills theories, which are QCD like in some ways, uh, with n n equal to four supercharges. So there's a duality between such theories, which are strongly coupled and classical gravity in 10 dimensions, where the five dimensions live in so-called anti-dissider space, uh, and then there are five dimensions which are kind of curled up, which are not visible, so that's S5. So it's it's 10 dimensional gravity. Uh, so the idea there is that you can compute correlators in this n equal to four um, Yang Mills of fields of, of, of any object there. Uh, and then you can use this ADS CFT duality uh, to compute them using weakly coupled gravity. Okay, so you can formulate the problem weakly coupled gravity, which we know how to solve. So you can learn something about truly strongly coupled theories, uh, which are QCD like um, using this duality. Now, this is a beautiful idea, it almost seems miraculous. Um, and there are some very nice results which have been derived using this duality on, on strongly coupled gauge theories. However, it's not QCD. So one, so it's, it's not the right theory on both sides of the conjecture. So our, our universe is not anti de Sitter, it's de Sitter, it has positive curvature. Uh, and on the QCD side, it's also not the right theory because it's 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 a supersymmetric Yang Mills theory. It has four hypercharges. It has a lot of fields in addition to just Yang Mills. Uh, and so there are some qualitative differences between um, these two theories, which 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 urge that we take the results as. Um, with, with a degree of caution in the sense that one cannot directly necessarily apply them to QCD, but they can give some insight into how QCD actually works in particular cases. Uh, and so that's kind of the approach. But to literally apply it to QCD, one has to further modify this duality, and then one introduce, introduces a level of ad hocness, uh, which is then problematic. Um, so that's, that's the one clean limit. The other clean limit is that of highly occupied QCD. That's the stuff I've been talking about at weak coupling. So there, the coupling is very weak. Like I said, G goes to zero. While the coupling times the occupancy, G squared times F, is a order one. So there are many theories in nature which have this feature, 
Um, so, for example, cold atomic gases uh, are, are of the sort where you can get very strongly correlated dynamics in this limit of the theory, even though the theory is formulated in weak coupling. Because the effective coupling that one gets in the system is not G, but it's G squared times F. Okay, so it's the coupling times the occupancy, which really matters. And that gives you a lot of interesting, strongly correlated dynamics. In the CGC, for example, I argue to you that gives you unitarization of the theory uh, in, in the high energy limit. So there's some very non-trivial physics that one gets. Now, there are also open questions here because you can say, well, okay, this coupling where what you're saying works may be much weaker coupling than where we have um, in heavy ion collisions at realistic energies. Uh, how do we know that the scales are right? Uh, you can also ask, well, suppose you extrapolate from very weak coupling to stronger coupling as we do. Um, how do we know that there's no additional physics that appears in this extrapolation? And that's also something that we don't clearly know answers to. Uh, all I can say is that there are, very, very, there are two clean limits. Uh, the latter limit is has the virtue that it is actually QCD that one is dealing with. Uh, and then one can really see if in the extrapolation to realistic couplings, whether something else shows up and maybe experiment can provide us with guidance in, in, in how we understand uh, whether this extrapolation is meaningful or not. It may be meaningful for some observables, may not be for others. So that's, a, that's an open area of research that, that, is, that is very interesting. Okay? Um, but anyway, you should keep in mind that in the rest of the stock, I'm going to be assuming that the coupling is very weak uh, and see how far we can go with that. So again, so this here's a cartoon again of what I said. So I have strong sources, which are the valence quarks. They have they have strength one over G, uh, and then I'm looking at producing particles. Now the way you produce an n particle distribution is in QCD. You write down these Feynman diagrams. Uh, in the presence of these sources, and then you find ways to, you, you cut these diagrams to put these quarks and gluons on shell, and that's how we produce uh, n particles in, in, in such theories. So this is a little technical slide, and I'm going to go through it very slowly, uh, and if you have any questions at any point, please feel, okay, someone's raising their hands. Right. So, uh, so to the best of my knowledge, the duality that we're talking about with classical gravity is only robust for n equal to four. That there is an, sorry? Um. Right, but in that case, then it doesn't really help us in in what we want because the whole idea is to understand strongly correlated matter, right? So, so if we are if we are working in weak coupling, we don't have to go beyond QCD, right? Because we don't need supersymmetry for that uh, purpose. In in if we want to understand strong coupling. Then if we have supersymmetry, it doesn't help us either unless we have some kind of duality to a weakly coupled gravity. So the whole logic of ADS-CFT was that you can understand strongly coupled QCD-like theories in terms of weakly coupled gravity. 
right? So then you could do your computations in gravity, and then those results would be valid for QCD. So you could do some cal classical calculation in gravity, and that classical calculation would tell you about all the quantum correlations of that QCD-like theory. So that is not there if we work in be beyond n equal to 4, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and then one has to, you know, ask whether there are other such dualities. Um, now, there are computations, by the way, in QCD in weak, uh, sorry, in QCD-like theories in weak coupling, which are where people have looked like for things like saturation. So, for example, in n equal to 4, supersymmetric Yang-Mills, you can also derive this BFKL equation, you can study saturation, all that has been done, actually. Um, and, and so th that th th there's a whole range of interesting results there. But that's all in weak coupling, again. Oh. Okay, thank you for your question. So, so now coming back to multiple particle production and weak coupling. Um, so as I said, the slide is very busy. I'm going to go through it very slowly. So there's a, there's a beautiful theorem due to Lehmann, Zemansik, and Zimmerman. Uh, it's sometimes called LSZ for short. And that's, it's, you'll find this theorem in any quantum field theory book. Um, and what it, what it says is that on the left hand side is the, X, is the, um, is, is, is the amplitude for producing n particles from a vacuum in state. So you, you want to produce n particles that are going out, uh, with momenta p1 to pn, uh, with a vacuum initial state. So that's your bracket amplitude. And this can be related on the right-hand side to the following um, products, right, of, of uh, n particles. So I goes from 1 to n, where you have a Fourier transform of, of, the, uh, of, of, um, of NABLA uh, acting on the functional derivatives of sources acting on some generating functional. And that's this new of rho here. And this new of rho is a sum of all connected vacuum to vacuum diagrams, okay, in the theory. So you can, if you write down your path integral, you can re-express that, uh, all that physics in terms of connected vacuum to vacuum diagrams. Okay? Um, and so here's, so this is the expression that one has. Now, if I want to compute the probability now, right, to produce n particles, what would I do? I would take the modulus squared, right, that's the next equation there. I would take the modulus squared of this amplitude to produce n particles, and then I have to integrate over the phase space of these particles, right, I impose momentum conservation, and then that gives me this phase space, which is dqpi over 2e pi. Uh, that's, fa that's the invariant phase space of each particle, and the product of them divided by n factorial. These are identical particles. So now if I plug in the equation on the, the, the first, the top of the page into the second equation for p sub n, I can rewrite p sub n as the, in the following way. It's one over n factorial of some function d sub n acting on this connect exponential of this uh, connected vacuum to vacuum graphs um, the um, uh, and, and and that I can write on a schwinger keldish contour as the difference between this the sum of all connected vacuum to vacuum graphs on the top contour given by plus in the presence of currents with uh, denoted by j plus and on the bottom contour, uh, is the same thing, right, with, with um, connected vacuum to vacuum graphs denoted by currents J minus. Okay, and this D sub N is basically, if you work out the line one and line two, it's what, what is resulting from that, that insertion. I can write that as something uh, which is just a pure uh, Green's function, G plus minus, uh, which is the same thing, by the way, as just dqp or 2e plus, just this invariant phase space times its Fourier transform. And then I have these nabla-nabla uh, terms, 
And then I have two functional derivatives. One is j plus on the top contour, and the other is with respect to j minus on the bottom contour. So that's obtained really by, if you take the first equation on my slide here, you plug it into the second equation, you can rewrite it as a third equation, where d is now defined in this following way here. Okay? And so this is nothing but the schrodinger keldish formulation of quantum field theory, where typically one can write down the Feynman propagators of a free particle in terms of these plus-plus objects. So these are time-ordered products that are of currents which are living either on the top con part of the contour, that's a plus-plus, so if I'm looking at fields, where both fields are on the top contour, or if I'm looking at anti-time-ordered products which are in the minus contour, so that's again just your Feynman propagator, where I switch i by to minus i and plus i epsilon to minus i epsilon, and similarly, g plus minus is nothing then but, but the product of fields which are on where one field is on the top contour and the other field is on the bottom contour. And that's basically just a delta function, right? It's an on-shell propagator with a particular well-defined frequency, which is this theta p naught. And g minus plus is just theta plus p naught, which is also a delta function. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, did Professor Arts in his lecture talk about schwinger keldish Yes? Uh, Blazer also talked about it in his lectures. Okay, okay, so there's some familiarity here. But anyway, so I'm going to, so, but this is really, um, self-contained in the sense that if you really think about this LSZ formalism where you relate amplitudes to propagators, then you can, uh, that because that's exactly what it does, it takes n particle amplitudes and relates them to propagators, then you can go through this exercise on the slide and you will get p sub n in terms of these d's, which are these objects at the bottom, okay, which are nabla with two functional derivatives, one living on the top contour, the other in the other contour. And the way you then compute things is that you set the currents on the top contour and the bottom contour equal to each other. Yeah. Now, when you do calculations in usual PQCD, right, or in, in just standard perturbation theory, what you then also do at the end of the day is you put j equal to zero. Okay, you say you have j plus equal to j minus equal to j, and then you put it equal to zero at the very end. In our case, we will not put it equal to zero because there are actual physical sources for the particles that we are producing. These are the valence quarks, right? And the, the large X quarks and gluons. These are acting as sources for the small X gluons. So they're actual physical sources that one has and you can't put them equal to zero. That is a qualitative difference between what we're doing here and the standard way you calculate things in perturbative QCD. Okay, and it has profound consequences in terms of what we compute. So, for example, if I want to compute, say, the inclusive multiplicity um, in, in, a, in a high energy collision, so what is the inclusive multiplicity? It's just n times p sub n, where p sub n is the probability to produce n particles summed over all particles, right? So now if I construct the generating functional from this p sub n, right, in the previous slide, I can show, again, quite simply, that this can be written as this d object that I had here, which was, again, the functional derivative of, with respect to rho rho, right? So d by dj, d by dj, right? Uh, acting on a new object, so this piece of n can be rewritten as e to the d of e to the i sum of the connected vacuum to vacuum graphs minus i sum of connected vacuum to vacuum graphs. And this object together can be rewritten as the schwinger keldish sum over vacuum-to-vacuum -vacuum graphs defined on this contour here. Okay. So basically then the inclusive multiplicity is d with these two functional derivatives acting on this object here e to the i of sum of connected vacuum-to-vacuum -vacuum schwinger keldish graphs. Okay. So this is with no approximations at all. And so with this done, then remember D was 
had what can be written in terms of this g plus minus naught, right? And so that appears. The z here is some renormalization factor that I'm going to ignore. Uh, and then the two functional derivatives acting on e to the i v has two possible terms. They can both act separately on either j plus can act on on v s k or j minus, right? So, so if I have two functional derivatives acting on e to the i v of s k, they can both separately act on e s by s k. In that case, I can write this as a product gamma plus gamma minus of x and y, or they can both both act on the say simultaneously on e to the i s k, and that's what I call gamma plus minus of x and y. Okay, and so the first object, gamma plus of x, uh, or gamma plus of y, uh, that is a one-point function in the schrodinger keldish formalism. So what, what I've written in this ex expression for average n is, uh, is the product of two one-point functions, and that's represented by this cartoon below here. Um, and the other term is the two-point function, in the background field, which corresponds to both of these fields being simultaneously taking functional derivatives of the connected vacuum to vacuum graph. By the way, can you see the cursor when I move it on the on the slide? Okay, thank you. Excellent. That's very helpful. Okay, so that's so at this point, there's no approximations. If you start from the previous slide at the very top using LSZ. You know, go through the definition of probability, which is quite intuitive, right? Uh, and you can just rewrite everything uh, in this way here, okay, without any approximations, just formal manipulations that one has. But then this turns out to be extremely powerful, as you can see. So now let's say I have strong fields, right? And I'm trying to compute the um, I'm trying to compute the inclusive multiplicity systematically. So in that case, at leading order, right, which is one over g squared, there's no contribution from the second term here, okay? Because that's a genuine quantum correction. It's a two-point function in a background field. And at leading order in, in, in one over g squared, there's no contribution. So this is the only contribution that's there. So at leading order, so I'm here, I've given an example of a scalar phi cube theory for simplicity. Uh, we'll generalize this to QCD in a minute. So there, the picture of the inclusive multiplicity is follows. Let's assume that I have this field Y, which is living on the plus part of the contour. Um, and then I follow this field all the way and I'm in inserting all strong sources. So I've just shown you an example where I have three of these on this side here. But in principle, I can have an infinite number of such trees. Okay. And the reason is that with each source row, it's of order one over g, right? So that's suppressed by the coupling g here as shown with my cursor. So one over g times g is of order one. So adding this tree here does not, it's the same order in the computation as having one, two, three, n trees. So I have to add all possible n trees. So you can see that it, it's enormously complicated to compute this in perturbation theory. I would have to compute explicitly all of these propagators. But there's a tremendous, beautiful simplification that occurs, okay? Which is, now, how do I, is there a question? Hello? Okay. Okay, I, I'm just hearing an echo, I guess. <laughs> so, so say now I'm doing this computation. I start with plus, I go down here. Now this node here, I have both plus and minuses. So in schrodinger keldish I have to sum over all plus minus currents on both contours that are living on both contours. So I have all these intermediate steps where I have to sum over plus and minus. Okay. So with each propagator, I have two, with each such line here, I have two propagators. Okay, so suppose I go from plus to some i here. Okay, now i can be both plus and minus. Okay, so when I now go to the next one here, the propagator is g naught i plus minus g naught i minus because I have to sum over both. 
plus and minus. And when I do that, that gives me the retarded Green's function. Okay? So it's just the Green's function with initial conditions at minus infinity that are evolving forward. So all these sum over all these Feynman propagators uh, just gives me something which is a retarded propagator. And so if I use this idea to construct all possible lines in these trees that I can get, remember, as I said, you can have as many sources as you like because they're all of the same order. I can have arbitrary number of insertions. If I use this identity all the way along all these trees, the sum of all the tree diagrams is just the retarded solution of the classical equations in motion with the initial condition for the classical equation of motion at minus infinity being equal to zero. Okay. But this is a remar remarkable result because if you were trying to compute this average multiplicity at leading order in 1 over d squared in perturbation theory using, using Feynman diagrams, you would have to sum all these Feynman diagrams of all these trees simultaneously for an infinite number of trees. That's virtually impossible to do, right? But what we have shown is that this is exactly equivalent to solving just classical equations in motion. Okay, you can follow the schringer keldysh contour all the way and you can replace every propagator by a retarded propagator. And that's exactly the same result one would get if you solved a nonlinear classical equation with some source. You solve that nonlinear classical equation in terms of Green's functions and you did it iteratively with each order of the source, you would find you would get exactly the same result. So, so what, this has profound implications because this first principles formalism is telling us that from first principles in QCD, right, the leading order result for producing the inclusive multiplicity, right, for, for finding all those, the average multiplicity of those, all those particles one is creating uh, in a heavy ion collision is given by the solutions of the QCD classical equations of motion okay, with initial conditions at minus infinity. And that's the QCD Yang Mills equation. So if I can solve the QCD Yang Mills equations, that is a first principle solution to leading order 1 over g squared, right, of the problem of multiparticle production. So that's in principle a very powerful result. Okay. Now you can say, okay, okay, you told me about the leading order solution. How do you go to the next order, right, of the solution? Um, so the leading order was 1 over g squared, right? The next order is or order 1, okay, g to the 0. That's the next order. Now, next order, this diagram that I had here, right, this gamma plus minus that I had where both of these sources act on the schrodinger keldysh vacuum-to-vacuum -vacuum graph, uh, as shown here, that starts to contribute, okay? So at order g to the zero, you have contributions both from this diagram and from this diagram. So you have to include both. So that's represented by this guy here, okay? And so then the, the average multiplicity to next to leading order has the following form right, at order g to zero, it's a product of a classical field that's given by here, okay, times, so there's a cut propagator here, so it's a product of two classical fields. Here I have the one loop correction to the classical field, so this is a loop correction to the classical field. But n and low, I have a contribution which is not the product of classical fields, but the classical field times a one loop correction to the classical field. And then this new contribution is something different, is it's a one loop, genuine one loop correction in the background field that's given by this one here. Okay, and again, this is a cut propagator. So, so I'm producing a pair of particles in a strong background field. So I have all these background field sources and I'm producing a pair of gluons in this background field. And this is what's what's the small fluctuation propagator. So the propagator that reflects these, this pair with all these different um, sources is the small fluctuation propagator in the classical background field. 
Okay, so this formally is the NLO correction uh, to inclusive, the inclusive multiplicity in strong fields. Now in QCD, um, oh, there's a question. Uh, okay, so that's right. I, I was about to run out of time. Very good. So let's stop here for 10 minutes and then we start again. Okay. Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, I was I was going to do that again. So so let me kind of go through quickly again from the start very quickly uh, just to give you the chain of logic, right? So the chain of logic, remember, I started with LSZ, right? So I want to compute n particle production. I related an amplitude for producing n particles to the functional derivatives of the vacuum connected to connected graphs, right? So this is from the path integral in the presence of a source role. And then you can compute probabilities by taking the modulus squared and then integrating over all the phase space here of the particles, which then you could rewrite on the schringer keldish contour with, with plus and minus currents, the probability in terms of this object here, where now these Vs are defined on this contour. So the pluses are all on the top part of the contour and the minuses are all on the minus part of the contour. And then these Ds could be rewritten in terms of this free propagator, this cut propagator here, um, which is an on-shell propagator times these derivatives of these of these fun uh, times the functional derivatives on these contours plus being here and minus being here right so so this is the general formalism so far and then the inclusive multiplicity is defined as just n times p sub n right if i wanted to compute two particle correlations that would be n times n minus one and then here also I would have n times n minus one here so i could go on like that but let's just for simplicity look at the inclusive multiplicity that's just n times p sub n and then if you just follow through the previous work in the previous slide, you'll get this D, which is this, again, this two functional derivatives acting on this object here, which I now call VSK. I've just rewritten this, and that's basically the sum of connected graphs on this entire contour here, all possible vacuum to vacuum connected graphs. And now I have to take derivatives with respect to D, right? But now D has two parts, one, so it, they can both, the two functional derivatives can each separately act on this, right? And that would be this gamma plus gamma minus, right? Where gamma plus is defined as one functional derivatives here, right? Acting on V with respect to J, or both of them, right? Can act on V simultaneously, right? And that's this object here. Now, when you compute things to leading order, right? So then, so then I went one further step. So basically, these are one-point functions. Yeah. Right. Hey, you, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. It, it should be, it's, it's, it's living on the other contour. Right. Yeah. So, sorry about that. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, so it's, 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 so actually one should think of it as V of some J plus and minus V of some J minus. Okay. So these are, these are different objects. Because remember, one lives on the top contour and the other lives on the bottom contour. Okay, and that's what gives you, and then you combine them all together into this VSK, and that, that's what lives, represents this living on the entire contour. Right, otherwise naively you'd say, well, this is just zero, right? <laughs> so, or, or this is just unity. So, yeah, these are different objects. Thank you. So can I go on? Okay. Okay. So so the so and then the other so then I said okay now let's look at so the bottom line all all of you have to keep in mind from now on is we're computing one and two point functions in a background field. Okay. Now when you look at the leading order solution 
which is of order 1 over g squared because the source is of order 1 over g, then the, this, this contribution has an additional coupling, right? That's g squared. So this is of, not of order 1 over g squared, it's of order 1, okay? While this is of order 1 over g squared. And so if I'm computing the leading order solution, this does not contribute, the second term. I only have to look at the first term. Okay, the second term only contributes when I go to next to leading order because then there's an additional factor of g squared. Right? So then I argue to you that the, that the leading order solution of this problem could be exactly rewritten in terms of the solution of the Yang-Mills equations, right, using this property of, of retarded uh, propagators in the schwinger keldish formalism, I could rewrite this is uh, solving for the inclusive multiplicity as precisely as the solution of the classical equations of motion with boundary conditions specified on some initial surface. Okay, so it's it's a you, you, you've specified on some initial surface and then you evolve it forward in time. And then one can do the same thing also to next to leading order where this object shows up here, okay, this two-point function. And so I argue to you that the inclusive multiplicity there now is a product of a classical field on one side of the cut and the, uh, the one-loop correction to the classical field Right? So remember, the solid line here is a cut propagator, okay? So it's on shell, it's not off shell. And so it can really be written as a product of a classical field times a one loop correction to a classical field. And then this, this object here is the pair production in the presence of a strong field where the two pairs are now on shell, okay? With this, with this cut here being on shell. So it's, it's what's sometimes called a small fluctuation propagator in the background field. This formalism is completely general in quantum field theory when you want to think about particle production in the presence of sources. So if you're doing, if you're computing pair production near a black hole or in, 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 in the Schringer mechanism, this is a universal formalism, okay, to compute this. So there's nothing I've said here up to this point that is, that is unique to QCD. But now in QCD, this, this actually helps us a tremendous amount because basically what I have said is that I can think about the problem of nuclear collisions as an initial value problem, okay? So what I have to do is then to specify some initial Cauchy surface, okay? So we know that in the theory of differential equations, all the information is, is captured if you specify your initial data on some initial disconnected surface where things can't talk to each other, and then you evolve it forward in time, right? And so the, the problem in quantum field theory, uh, in principle, you can formulate on some initial surface here, which is shown by this wedge. So this is two nuclei, right? So one nuclei is coming along one light cone, the other nucleus coming along the other light cone, they each have some thickness, right? And now I want to compute what's happening in the forward light cone here. And so by my argument, in principle, I could formulate all my initial data on some initial surface here. So I could, I could conjecture that this is the correct initial Cauchy surface uh, where there's no, all the data are specified. And then what I need to do is to compute the one loop fluctuations in the presence of this background field of this nucleus and the two loop um, fluctuation. So the small fluctuation propag sorry, the, the, this, the small fluctuation propagator in this background field here, right? Specified by the small fluctuation fields, uh, little a's of u and v where u and v are two points that live on this initial surface, okay? So sigma refers to the initial Cauchy surface. Now, in principle, there could be fluctuations where one field is at some u on one nucleus and the other field is at another u at, on another nucleus, right? And so I could, in principle, have a two-point function corresponding to this. 
If this were true, this would be a disaster in quantum field theory. Okay? Because what it's telling you is that if you have two nuclei that are coming at each other, right, then the quantum fields between the two nuclei could talk to each other before they actually collide. Okay, that's what this implies here. And so you would not have factorization. Factorization is the assumption that all the quantum fields of the projectile don't talk to each other before the collision. Okay? So in other words, all the quantum information in the collision from the initial state can be factorized into the products of this information from each of these guys. Okay? Now, what can, one can show in this formalism is that such fields talking to each other are suppressed, and they're suppressed by the thickness of the source here. Okay? So it's suppressed by one word, the energy. And so in a very high energy collision, these are very, very small corrections that you can ignore. They're much less than a percent level corrections. And so nuclei don't talk to each other for the collision, and that's the essence of QCD factorization. Now, the, the, the fluctuations in the background field of each of these guys, if you remember in my earlier lectures, I said they have logs, right? They have logs of the separation between large X and small X. So if P plus is a small X gluon, then there's logs corresponding to the lambda, which you can think of as corresponding to the inverse thickness of this nucleus here. So there's one such contribution of this sort from one nucleus, and then there's another such contribution from the thickness of the other nucleus and the other light cone, okay, with its large, with, with its small momentum. And so there's a factorization of, of, the, of the distributions from one nucleus and the distributions from another nucleus times their Jim Rule Camiltonia. And it's a sum of these two acting on the leading order operators that I want to compute that give me the analog correction in the forward light cone. Okay, so there's really nothing new I've introduced beyond these one and two point functions. And the way I've written this here is corresponds to the two point function times these two functional derivatives, which I've defined on this initial Cauchy surface here. That, that's this object here, right? Uh, and then, so sorry, these are the product of each of these guys here. And then there's a genuine, uh, excuse me, that there's this object here, which corresponds to this, uh, this two point function here. And then there's a one-point function contribution corresponding to this, which corresponds to a functional derivative with respect to the gauge field on this surface. Okay, so this is like the sources for the evolution of the forward light cone. Okay, so this, um, I apologize, this is, this is a little complex, but it now gets kind of interesting as we go ahead. So now if I want to compute this multi-particle production, which is this very complicated thing that I said, I can write down, for example, the stress energy tensor, uh, which corresponds to you know, the energy density and the pressures as a function of proper time, space-time rapidity, and the transverse coordinate uh, to all orders where some all logs in the evolution of these weak partons okay, as a functional integral of this weight functional that I introduced in the previous lectures, which captures all the n-body correlations uh, of these of these large X gluons in one nucleus times the same thing in the other nucleus. Uh, so these are the two rapidities in each of the two nuclei. Uh, and then times the leading order stress energy tensor or energy density or pressure, if you like, uh, of these classical gluon fields that, that one computes by solving the Engels equations. Okay, so, so if I want to compute to all orders in perturbation theory at small x, um, the distribution, the energy density in the forward light cone, I can write that in terms of the solution of the Yang-Mills equations in the forward light cone. So that's a leading order stress energy tensor convoluted with the distribution of color sources in one nucleus times that of the other nucleus uh, at some given rho. And then at these rows, I compute this and Mills thing, and I then average over all sources. So that's so essentially the plasma factorization that one obtains to compute the energy density and pressure in the forward light cone can be written as a product of universal density matrices. So these I can actually 
extract from deep elastic scattering of the nucleus, for instance, uh, times the matrix element, which is just the leading order energy density and pressure obtained by solving Yangle's equations. So this is a very powerful way to write down, uh, absorb all these quantum information into computing the energy densities and pressures in the forward light cone. So explicitly what that looks like um, is that of when we do computations, essentially what we're doing is we're solving the Yang-Mills equations. So here's what the Yang-Mills equations look like. So on the left-hand side, I write this as a covariant derivative, d mu, uh, acting on the field strength tensor, which now is nonlinear. It has this nonlinear term here. So it's this very nonlinear object. And on the right-hand side, I have the two sources. So this is the color charge density of one nucleus moving along one light cone. Okay, so it's a delta of x minus. It's Lorentz contracted in the x minus direction. And then there's another source which is living on the other light cone. So it's the other nucleus that's coming in with its own color charge density. Okay, and now it's a delta function in x plus on the other light cone. Right? Now, each of them has only one large component of the current uh, because the sources are static sources in the light cone, and all the other contributions to the current are suppressed by either 1 over p plus for this guy or 1 over p minus for the other guy. So they're very small directions. So this is the solution of the yang mills equations, and this is something that one can try and do. Now, analytically, we don't know how to solve these equations because of this very nonlinear term here, right? And this term is as big as these two terms. So I cannot ignore this term except in perturbation theory. But in our case, we, are, we have a very non-perturbative situation. So this term is as big as these two terms, but we know how to do this numerically, okay? Um, and But before we go there, I should mention that the lumpiness that one gets corresponds to saying that these color charge densities, right, are localized in these nuclei on distance scales given by the saturation scale, okay? So the correlator of rho A, rho B for a Gaussian nucleus, right, as in the MV model that we talked about, is given by the saturation scale here. And in principle, one can take this as an input from deep elastic scattering data, okay? So you can take this as an input from scattering data that gives me the correlators of rows, right? So for each solution of the yang mills equations as a function of rho, I can solve it. And then I can take averages, right? That introduces a scale, QS. And so all my final results for the energy density, I can write in terms of these QSs, which I obtain from fits to deep plastic scattering data, right? So, um, so this is um, the first principles formulation of the leading order um, problem. And so here's the result of numerical simulation. So initially you start out with very lumpy initial conditions. And then as a function of time, you find that uh, these, these kind of smoothen out, right? And what's shown here is the initial um, longitudinal electric and magnetic fields, which start out to be very large. Uh, while the transverse electric and magnetic fields are very small, uh, but then over time they kind of evolve towards each other and then they kind of go down, right? Um, now, what is interesting is that if you ask what is the initial pressure that corresponds to this, the initial longitudinal pressure is actually negative, okay? And so this means that there's actually this, this, this stuff that's actually pushing outwards, right? while the pressure at a given rapidity is actually decreasing with time, right? It's, it's negative. Uh, and it actually goes to zero from below with time evolution. So this is just the classical solution of the Yang-Mills equations. It's a numerical realization of that. And so here's another way of looking at this. So on the left-hand side is a numerical simulation of just the solutions of the plasma color fields and you see initially that it has some structure, but then if you just let the gluon fields evolve, it kind of becomes spherically symmetric uh, because these objects are just free streaming. 
while we know that from heavy ion collisions that somehow this must be matched onto hydrodynamics in some way because the data seems to show that the shape that we see for an asymmetric collision is preserved uh, in, in somehow in the data. So we know that the data knows about this, while from the left-hand side plot, if it were just Yang-Mills fields, then you would not see any such structure in the data. It would be very small. And so we know that there's the problem of how do we go from the left-hand plot to the right-hand plot is one of the outstanding problems in, in this field, how we do that. Now, again, if we, if we come if we come to QCD, then uh, the, the problem that I mentioned is, again, like I said, it's the gluon pair production in the background field at NLO. And then there's a one loop correction to the classical field that's shown here. Uh, so it's a sum of these two kinds of contributions. Now, when I argued to you that you had this glasma factorization in my previous slides, um, I was actually lying to you, okay? And the reason I was lying to you is because in, in this factorization, I was only taking into account static modes that, that were present before the collision. So that was shown on this backward wedge that I had here uh, of, these, of these gluon fields. However, if once the collision happens, the sources become time dependent. They get rotated in the collision between the, in the, of the two nuclei, and the sources become time dependent. So they're no longer static sources anymore. And so there's new physics that occurs when one goes to the forward light cone right at the collision of these two guys. So in the language of this, of this light cone coordinates, the sources that were static corresponded to zero P eta equal to zero modes. Okay, these were the truly static ones that I could show factorized between the two guys. And these P eta equal to zero modes could be absorbed in the evolution of the wave functions of each of the two nuclei. However, the, the, when the sources become time dependent, they correspond to P eta not equal to zero modes. And these were something that I had ignored. Okay? And what these P eta is equal to zero modes correspond to are functional derivatives, right? So suppose I compute the gauge field here at some late time given by x. They are what actually describe the evolution of these gauge fields if they were specified on some this initial surface here. And these can grow very rapidly. Okay? So, so in principle, okay, this, this gauge field at some late time here, right, when evolved from an initial gauge field at this initial light cone surface here, can have a very rapid growth. In principle, it can be an exponential growth as shown here. Okay. And these modes were not included in my previous discussion. Okay. And so that, and that's part of the NLO computation in the forward light cone that was ignored. And this turns out to be a big effect. So one can show that if you start with some initial static, these are boost invariant gauge fields, which don't, which correspond to P eta equal to zero modes, right? These modes that I mentioned here, these P eta equal to zero modes mean that the gauge fields here don't depend on the space-time rapidity. Okay. So these are then of order one over G, they're large. And that's the numerical solution I showed you. Now, if I perturb these classical solutions by a small quantum fluctuation, okay, which is depends on eta, so it's p eta not equal to zero, then we find that this is a numerical simulation for the Fourier transform of the pressure as a function of time on the x-axis, and you see that this grows extremely rapidly. Okay, it grows as an exponential of the square root of time. Okay, so even though I have a very small quantum fluctuation initially, it, it just explodes. Okay? It's sometimes called a butterfly effect. A very small fluctuation can become very, very large on very short time scales. And so even though I started out with the assumption that the classical fields were dominant, they were 1 over G, the quantum fluctuations which were suppressed 
right? They're order one compared to one over G. This is big. They become of the same order on a very short time scale, right? So you can ask, when do these fluctuations become of the order of these fluctuations here? And that's on a very short time scale, which is given by one over QS times the log squared of one over alpha. The reason you have log squared is because this is a square root here. If it were just a pure e to the QS tau, that would just be a log. So this is a very rapid time scale over which the quantum fluctuations become of the order of the classical field. And so what, do, what does one do? One could ask if we can resum all such contributions that are large in some way, and then rewrite that uh, in some simpler form as suggested here. So, so another way of saying it is the following. So suppose I were computing the stress energy tensor in the forward light cone, and I was including all these quantum fluctuations, which were shown in green, in the presence of these classical background field, right? Then the way I would do it is I would solve the small fluctuation equation of motion for these green fluctuations. So these are solutions of the Young-Mills equations with small fluctuations with some, with some retarded plane wave background field initial conditions. I can do that and compute this two-point function uh, of, of these uh, small fluctuations on this initial surface here. But now we find that this solution grows with time, okay? So it becomes large. So in principle, you could try and resum the next order, which looks like this also, and they're as big as these, this guy here, okay? So I can, I, so they are in principle suppressed. They go as g times the exponential to the fourth. But on, on the same time scale that I mentioned, this becomes as large as this diagram. Okay. Now you can also have more complicated kind of diagrams here, which are like three point functions, okay? And these are further suppressed, but not by much, okay? They are of order g. Of course, at small g, they're, they're, they're very small. But in principle, they can also grow large. Okay. So, in print, so one has a mess, but at least parametrically, you could say these are suppressed, and I wanted to resum these kinds of diagrams. And if you resum those kinds of diagrams, you can rewrite such quadratic fluctuations as an initial spectrum of fluctuations of these little gauge fields at the initial surface times some initial distribution. I mean, this this is the initial spectrum f times a leading order stress energy tensor of the classical field plus the little quantum fluctuation, okay? So I don't have room here to describe how one can do this. You have to trust me and we can discuss this later if you're interested. But basically with a little shift of the classical field, you can capture all of these kinds of diagrams here, okay? Uh, and absorb them in the evolution and, and then compute the resummed stress energy tensor in the forward light cone. So you have some initial spectrum of fluctuations. By the way, this is very similar to what people talk about in the early universe when they have the inflaton field is expanding and they have quantum fluctuations around the, they're on the um, inflaton field. They have similarly a, a, a spectrum of initial primordial fluctuations, which people often take, in, take as Gaussian. Okay, and that means that they have just Gaussian, just like a Gaussian two-point function of the classical field. But in but a lot of people now in the literature uh, also try to talk about non-Gaussian fluctuations, non-Gaussianities in inflation, and that correspond to precisely these kinds of contributions that that we have argued are are small, okay, uh, at small g. So this is exactly analogous to the discussion in the inflationary literature of cosmology um, and in the context of heavy ion collisions. So, so now what, okay? So just to recap, I started out with these nuclei colliding, right? And then after the collision, these nuclei recede, they produce these, these um, classical fields, but then there are quantum fluctuations about the classical fields, which grow exponentially. And I argued to you that one can resum the leading Gaussian fluctuations. So my final result for the energy density, where I sum all the logs in X from the wave function and all the unstable corrections from the exponential growth of fields, can be rewritten the following way. 
For some distribution of sources in the wave function, I have a factorization of these weight functionals, which cal capture all the many body correlations in the wave function. And then for each of these rows, I also have an additional spectrum of fluctuations that I have to integrate over times the leading order solution of the Yang Mills equations plus some little shift, which is given to me by the spectrum of fluctuations here. Now, what this does, okay, is to create a classical field in which you, through this process here, this exponential growth of fluctuations scrambles information. Okay? And this scrambling of information, okay, due to this growth of fluctuations, is seen in many systems in nature, and it can be thought of as what leads to decoherence of primordial classical fields. Okay, so if you had some classical field, and eventually you want to understand whether that classical field thermalizes, it needs to go through a process of scrambling of information where all the coherent many-body physics in the classical field is somehow destroyed over time, where you can then replace things in terms of single particle distributions. Um, and this process of scrambling is absolutely critical. Okay, um, And so this path integral over multiple initializations of classical trajectories is sometimes called eigenstate thermalization uh, in the statistical mechanics literature, and let me just um, come to that. So, so rather than QCD, let's consider a much simpler theory, which is a scalar phi four theory. Okay, uh, and, and let's even consider um, right. So let's consider a scalar phi four theory, where again I have now some classical field. Right, that's a solution. And again, it's boost invariant. It doesn't depend on eta. And then I have some small fluctuations about the classical field, which I represent in terms of some Gaussian random variables. The coefficients are Gaussian random variables, where they are the, the correlator uh, is some delta function. Um, and then there's some um, there's some solution to the small fluctuation equations given by chi, uh, which is a function of, of transverse, um, transverse coordinate, which is then given by the small fluctuation equation. So this is the same small fluctuation equations as in QCD, which now depends on the second derivative of the potential um, of, the, of the theory. Uh, so it's an eigenvalue equation that I can solve. And then the time dependence is given by Hankel functions. Okay, if it's an expanding system, I have Hankel functions that I can solve, which give me the time dependence in terms of these eigenvalues lambda that I compute here. Now, these quantum modes that we compute, right, which are Gaussian random variables, they satisfy something which is called a Berry conjecture due to Michael Berry, um, where he conjectured that if you have a if you have a quantum system that's evolving, say a closed quantum system, and you look at its high lying eigenmodes, okay, of this quantum system, so high energy modes, so by solving this kind of equation here, if the system is classically chaotic, right, then he conjectured that these eigenmodes are are have coefficients which are Gaussian random variables. Okay, so the solutions of these are Gaussian random variables. Further, the dynamics of the system would just be controlled by the corresponding two-point Wigner distribution. So that's the two-point function that I was mentioning, uh, which, which actually controls the dynamics of the evolution of this quantum system. And then there's a further important conjecture in statistical mechanics that is originally due to Shrednicki, where he said that if systems obey Berry's conjecture, so if you have a quantum system that obeys Berry's conjecture, uh, namely that it's classically chaotic and that the high-lying eigenstates are Gaussian random variables, then these systems will 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 display something called eigenstate thermalization. Okay? So in other words, it will scramble the quantum information that's present in the initial state. And that's 
Um, so that seems very much like QCD, you know, because QCD is also classically chaotic theory that we know. And I just argued to you that in heavy ion collisions, it seems like the leading contributions are given by these um, these two point uh, Wigner functions that one has, um, uh, which are then could be understood as coming from some Gaussian source. Um, so what what we showed that if you now consider a scalar theory, but now just in, for simplicity, just look in one plus one dimensions, and you solve the scalar theory in time for just the classical fields, you find that the energy and pressure have no relation to each other, right? So you can compute T11, which is the pressure, and T00, uh, shown here, divided by three, that's this yellow dashed line here, they have no relation to each other, right? The pressure is kind of just fluctuating like mad and the energy density is just flat, flat line. And this is in one plus one dimensions. But now we introduce some fluctuations as, as shown here, right? Uh, and then you average over all these fluctuations. And then you see that in this theory that the pressure fluctuates very rapidly and then converges to the energy density over three here. And so again, so this spectrum of fluctuations, which are Gaussian random variables, converges the system to a single valued equation of state as you would in say hydrodynamics or in a thermal system. And this phenomenon has been called pre-thermalization previously in the literature. Okay? Uh, so the idea basic being is that if you have some classical highly occupied field that's, that's evolving in time, like in the early universe or in a heavy ion collision, the quantum fluctuations which are unstable around those classical fields can actually help thermalize the field as it evolves in time. And so from this perspective, right, the scrambling phenomenon of the ex explosive growth of quantum fluctuations and the resulting pre-thermalization are say that it may be sufficient to just consider Gaussian random variables. We may not need to know all the details of the spectrum of fluctuations. So if I were to, from QCD, try to really compute these you know, two-point correlators in great detail in this background field, or three-point correlators and so on, this gets to be enormously difficult and some time-dependent problem of strong fields. And then from that perspective, it could be completely hopeless uh, as, as uh, would be suggested. So in some sense, you would say, okay, this is an impossible problem. But if, if these conjectures are correct, then it may be sufficient to consider just Gaussian random variables and the details of all these two and three point functions and so on may not matter. The only thing that will matter is that they are random Gaussian variables. And we will see that this conjecture is confirmed spectacularly and it leads to novel, a novel turbulent attractor in the plasma. Okay, so these quantum fluctuations really qualitatively change the structure of, of, of what we see in heavy ion collisions and leads to thermalization. So um, the way you would do it is the following. So you'd start with some gauge fields, which are a function of time in some initial time and some, you know, it has some transverse uh, distribution and space-time distribution, space-time rapidity. And you start with some initial condition, which is highly occupied. So I have a prefactor, uh, which I write as square root of f here. So it's a square root of the occupation number. And there's some n naught, which is large, which characterizes the occupation number, times one over alpha s, right? So this is a highly occupied system going as one over alpha s. And I assume just some theta function type distribution here of f shown on the left-hand side. Okay, uh, up to some hard scale, which is which could be QS in my problem. And then I assume that the initial distribution here is in momentum space, either prolate or oblate. So I can vary psi naught from you know much larger or smaller than one. And depending on that, it can be either prolate or oblate. So if, if psi naught is one, then it's perfectly spherical in momentum space. But if it's greater and smaller than one, it's either prolate or oblate. And so then I have this initial occupancy, and then I have, say, that the gauge fields are characterized by some just some polarization vectors here, 
Um, so because, you know, they are vector fields uh, and they carry polarization, uh, and these are given to me by these Hankel functions that I mentioned to you earlier. Uh, but then now they're multiplied by Gaussian random variables. So this is my Gaussian random number field, um, which which is just pure Gaussian random numbers as characterized by these variables here. Okay. Uh, and so now I can try and solve the equations of motion, the yang mills equations of motion with these Gaussian random number fields. And I have to do it in some fixed gauge in QCD, which is in this case the Fock Schringer gauge, where a tau, where tau is a proper time, is zero. So I can solve this equation of motion uh, on a lattice, okay? Uh, and because it's a gauge theory, I have to solve this on a lattice. Uh, I won't go into this in much detail, except to say that these numerical simulations that we did uh, of these Yang Mills equations are very large on very large lattices. So spatially, these are 256 squared uh, in, in the transverse direction and 4096 in the longitudinal direction. So we look at very, very large lattices. Uh, we have to fix a uh, particular gauge in the solution. And then you define a gauge field in terms of link variables, uh, which is required for gauge invariance. And then you solve Hamilton's equations as a function of time to get solutions to these yang mills fields. Okay. So this is um, kind of the end of my lecture here. Um, and the next, in my next lecture, I will um, really describe what the consequences of this are, uh, how one gets an attractor solution um, for these plasma fields. And then I'm also going to talk about how this leads to thermalization and some interesting interdisciplinary connections as well, okay? that, like I promised. So um, I think I would end here. Um, I have a few minutes extra in case there are some questions uh, from the audience. Well, well, it, it shouldn't. I mean, so first of all, I mean, there's two things. One is you're fixing the overall gauge um, as being this Fox Schwinger gauge, right? So what this means is that um, you um, th 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 you cannot have time dependent gauge transformations uh, which which matter, right? Because you have fixed a tau equal to zero. So any gauge transformations that would modify your results have to be time independent. And then you still have a residual gauge freedom on the transverse degrees of freedom. And that again, you have a freedom to choose. Uh, and in this case, uh, a Coulomb gauge is natural because it really fixes the two polarization degrees of freedom of the, of the gauge fields. Um, in principle, one can try something else, um, but this is a natural gauge choice. Um, and the, of course, one should check that your physical observables are insensitive to this choice of gauge. Now, one way to not worry about it is to actually compute gauge invariant quantities. And so in this paper here, we actually computed gauge invariant quantities. So for, for example, something like the pressure is a gauge invariant quantity and it shouldn't really care about how I fix my residual gauge freedom. Okay, so that's a theorem, right? So if you find that it does, then you've just made a numerical error. And so, um, so you can compute gauge invariant quantities, they shouldn't really care about this. Now, there are things that one can compute, like say number distributions, which may be sensitive to the choice of gauge. Now, I think the, the paper that you're referring to really is not from these full numerical simulations of, of the gauge fields, but they are from some semi-analytic solutions that one has to this full problem.
And there people have computed um, results in different gauges and they agree with each other. I don't know if this answers your question. Right. Right. Yeah, so 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 yeah, that's a that's a very very good question. And um in, in fact, um if I can just um if you, if you bear with me for a second, I um I mean, usually, you know, I think that I um, I have two. I usually don't finish my slides, and so I thought I was I, I left out some slides where I was going to talk about precisely that. Um, but so so let me just say it in in words, and then I'll show it to you explicitly in my next lecture. Uh, is that the whole? Yeah. So if you just do the classical solutions, of course, it gives you this crazy result that the launch of pressure is zero. But now if you include these quantum fluctuations and you do this exercise that I mentioned, what you see is that you actually generate significant longitudinal pressure. But, but then what happens is that the longitudinal pressure, you know, depending on what initial conditions I choose here, so suppose I choose this initial condition to be either prolate or oblate, that generates actually quite a large longitudinal pressure but then we find that the the result for PL or PT, right, the longitudinal pressure or the transverse pressure, approaches a universal curve. Okay, so I can change psi naught how much ever I want and generate a huge longitudinal pressure or a small one, depending on psi naught at some given time. Uh, and similarly, I can vary this occupancy and not here. But what I will find from the numerical simulations is that independent of n naught and psi naught, the system goes to one universal curve of PL over PT. And what you find is that its PL over PT is not zero, but it decreases as tau to the minus two thirds. Okay, so the PL over PT does not go to one, okay, but it decreases as tau to the two thirds. Now it's not free streaming because if the system are free streaming, PL over PT would go as 1 over tau squared. So instead of 1 over tau squared, it goes as 1 over tau to the 2 thirds. Okay. But it's universal. It doesn't care about what the initial conditions are. And how that problem is then resolved in full is the topic of my next lecture. So there's, there's a very interesting set of, of things that occur on the way to thermalization. And so if you will bear with me with the next lecture, I will, I will answer your question. But the bottom line is you're absolutely right. The classical solutions are not right. They, they, they just, I mean, that, it's, what they, it's what it is, right? So it's what it is. It gives you PL equal to zero very quickly. So the quantum fluctuations are absolutely critical in solving the problem. And it's not surprising that they're critical because they become of the same order of the classical field in, in a logarithmic time scale, right? Very short time scale, they, become, they grow, they grow exponentially, right? So that's this, that's this thing here, the quantum fluctuations grow exponentially. And so on a very short time scale, they become as large. And so we have to take this physics into account. And when we take this physics into account, that leads to this whole scrambling that I described and which can be simulated by this thing here. And when you solve these equations, you find actually that you do generate significant pressure. But that significant pressure is not enough in the, the initial stages. And then there's more non-trivial dynamics. And that is somehow also related to this jet quenching that Professor Blaiseau talked about in his lecture. And I will discuss that in my next lecture as to how the system then evolves to thermalization. So it's not a full answer to your question, but I hope it at least intrigues you enough to 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 uh, listen to the next one.
Yeah, so thank you. And, 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 and I promise my next lecture will be much less technical. So this was the most technical lecture. So, so my next lecture will be much less technical. So I hope to see you all tomorrow.